Admission webhooks, what are they? They are a minefield when you first start looking into them because they can be confusing. You might sit there and go, oh, I'm just going to go ahead and deploy a validating webhook configuration or a mutating webhook configuration. And then it doesn't work because you've not configured anything to do something with those. It seems weird, right? There's a resource you can deploy, but if you don't deploy something in the background to do something with it, then it's pretty useless. It's not uncommon though, think ingress. You need an ingress controller to manage an ingress resource being deployed. And it's kind of the same thing. Admission webhooks are HTTP callbacks that receive an admission request, and when they do, they do something with them. That's it, that's all they are. So what I mean by that is you can have a program running in your cluster that receives the admission request. It will go, I'm looking for a pod. I'm gonna deal with pods. So is this a pod? Yes. Has it got X label? In the case of the validating webhook, you might say, if it hasn't got this label, just reject it. That's it, it's not coming onto my cluster without that label. In the case of a mutating webhook though, you might say, is this a pod? Has it got this label? If it hasn't, we're gonna set it and we're gonna give it a sensible default. And with that, you've got a validating and a mutating webhook configuration. It sounds complex at first, but I promise we'll do the intro and then we'll get into it and hopefully it will make more sense. I'm still in front of the screen because I'm going to be doing quite a few examples up here instead of on screen like I usually do purely because writing things out on screen would just be boring for you just be watching me write a go program out which I've already done so I've uploaded it to github it's here and you can download that build the docker image and deploy it yourself the other reason I did it was because I feel like there's a more linear approach that I can take here which you can follow along probably easier than the way that I wrote it out. It makes more sense probably to walk through a little bit different. Let's just clarify what I've done. We've got a program here. This is a Golang program. It's nothing fancy. There's nothing amazing going on here. This is like not my best work, I will say. This is just something to show how it works. The process you would go through, sort of. Anyway, we've got a main function here. This main function just runs a TLS web service, which takes a certificate and a key, which I'll talk about in a second and it just has two endpoints. And those two endpoints are validate pods and mutate pods. Those two endpoints run functions respectively, and those functions do stuff when those endpoints are hit. So let's take a look at the function attached to the validate pods endpoint first. What it does is it checks to make sure it's an admission request first. If it is an admission request, it then checks to make sure it's a pod that we're dealing with. If it is a pod, then we check labels. If this particular label of teacher does not exist, we respond with no you are not coming onto this cluster. You're not coming on, you're not getting deployed. That's all that happens there. If the label does exist though, we let it onto the cluster. It gets deployed, everyone's happy. That's it, that's all the validating side does. I've simplified it quite a bit there, but that's essentially what's going on in this code. The mutating side pretty much does the same thing. So the mutating function, again, passes the admission request, makes sure it's a pod, and then it checks for labels again. But this time, what it does is check to make sure that labels isn't equal to nil, or that this super teacher label is equal to Druvenet is. If there's no labels, we're gonna add a label. That's basically what's going on here. And that's where the mutation comes in. We're mutating the pod. When we know we need to do something, we create a pack. We create an admission review. Now that review can, can just contain, yes, this is good, or it can contain a patch. And that patch is the thing we're gonna change. It's just a JSON patch, that's all it is. And that allows us to say, we're gonna add these things to the pod. This can be anything as well. This doesn't have to be pods, it can be deployments, it can be ingresses, it can be services, secrets, config maps, whatever. It can be absolutely anything that you can deploy into a cluster. But I'm saying I want this label to exist. So that's the program, that's what it does. We've packaged it up into a Docker file and that Docker file has been built and it's deployed via a deployment. And this deployment is nothing special again. We mount the secret that I'll go through in just a second, I promise, into the relevant locations so that the program can pick them up and use it and listen correctly on TLS. And that's it, that's it, that's the deployment. There's nothing fancy going on there. We've then got a service that routes traffic through to that deployment. So those certificates, what are those certificates? They are not your standard cert manager certificates that we've been dealing with so far. So the ones we've dealt with is we've said, created a domain in Cloudflare, and this is the domain I wanna create a certificate for, we're gonna use it on an ingress. That is a proper certificate, if you like. That is a properly signed certificate by Let's Encrypt, Acme, they have signed their our certificate authority. I wanna be my own certificate authority for this though, because this, this doesn't have a domain, this is just internal to the cluster. So that service, that needs to be our fully qualified domain name for the certificate. So what I've done is created an issuer, which creates a self-signed issuer. It then creates a secret, which I can then use to create a certificate authority. That might seem a bit weird if you don't know about TLS, but I promise you that makes sense. 
if you know about it. If it doesn't, don't worry too much. Certificate authority and certificates and all that lot can be a little bit confusing when you get into it. So I'm creating my own certificate authority here. So with this issuer, I then create this certificate. This certificate uses that issuer. I hope that makes sense. Anyway, certificates being generated, that will create a tls.crt, a tls.key, and a CA. So that will all exist within the secret that gets generated off the back of this certificate. And that looks like this. That's it. It's just a bunch of base64 encoded certificates. I can now mount those in to the deployment, as you can see, and the program will use those certificates. So I'm using the fully qualified domain name of the service as the certificate fully qualified domain name, the DNS name. I, I don't know how else to word that. That's pretty much it. We've got the deployment. We've got the service. We've got the certificates. We've got the certificates being mounted into this deployment. So what do we need now? Well, we need the validating webhook configuration and the mutating webhook configuration. They're pretty much the same thing. It's just really just the endpoint you're hitting. There's a couple of minor different features of them, but we'll just go through them both quickly just to show you how they work. So first we've got a name, pretty standard stuff. We've then got the webhook's name. Now that webhook's name can be whatever you want it to be. It doesn't have to be anything fancy. It doesn't have to be a domain like mine is here. It can just, it can literally be anything. It could just be called my webhook. You then have some rules, which basically saying when we create a pod, do something. And that something is defined in the client config, which has a service. And we're saying in the namespace, there is a service called this, and we want to hit this endpoint of that service. That endpoint is validate pods. So the path on what port? The CA bundle is the CA that come from the certificate. You still with me? I hope so. Because I realized this, like I said at the start, it can be a minefield, but I hope this is making sense. So that CA bundle comes from the certificate we created. Finally, we've got admission review versions, side effects, and timeout seconds. I'll leave a link to the description down below, as always, that explains those a little bit more because I'm not going to get into them right here. So that's your validating webhook configuration. Let's take a look at the mutating one. So as you can see, it's essentially the same thing. I have pretty much exactly the same configuration. So again, we have create pods. We have our client config for the namespace learning, for this service, for this path, for this port. With the CA bundle, admission review versions, side effects, and the timeout. So it's pretty much the same thing. We're just hitting a different path, really. That's all that's happening. So what happens now is when we create a pod, those two endpoints will be hit. When those endpoints are hit, the stuff that we said would happen in the program will happen, and then we will get a result. Oh, right, okay. Now that I've explained all that on here, let's actually just jump onto the machine and we'll go take a look at what's going on. So we'll do kubectl run, we'll call it test. We'll give it an image of Alpine latest. And then we'll give it a command of sleep infinity. And that's it. If I hit this, the validating webhook and the mutating webhook should fire. And it has. And the validations run. And basically it's saying the pod label is invalid. This means that the label teacher that we were looking for in the validation section doesn't exist. And that's the error we return as a result. So we could make that error more descriptive if we wanted to in the application itself. But as it stands, we're not allowed to put this on. So let's go ahead and just add that label. So we'll do label teacher equals true. And there we go. We've got the pod test created. We've added that label. So the validation webhook has permitted it to go into the cluster. And then all we need to do now is check that the mutating webhook has worked. So we'll do kubectl get pod show labels. And what we're expecting to see here is that super teacher label. And there it is. Super teacher equals Drew Bonetti's teacher equals Drew. And that's it. There it is right there. That's both of them working. Now, obviously we can do a lot more than what I've just done here with labels, but there you go. That is both of them working. The applications online have a look. It will be full of errors, by the way. You know, I'm, I haven't completely foolproofed it. So I'm sure if I try and add a pod with the super teacher label, I'll probably get an error. In fact, I'll quickly check it. So I'll do kubectl, delete pod, test. Okay, that's deleted. So we'll go back and we'll run that again. And we'll just go ahead and add that super teacher equals Drupanet is one. And I've got a feeling that there's probably an error in the app. Yeah, there you go. So the pod label is invalid. So I don't know if I can just, yeah, it's not working. So there's an error in the application. The application shouldn't be used. It was just here as a test to show how a basic validation and mutation can work. Now you've seen my bad Go programming at work. Let's uh, let's just leave it at that, I guess. So that's it for admission webhooks. And that's pretty much it for this series too. So firstly, I realized it was a lot of material in this video, maybe a little bit confusing. And if it was, just ask any questions down below in the comments and I will answer them. I'm hoping I didn't confuse you too much. And if anything, I'm hoping I cleared a few things up. As I say, you don't need to know Go. That's just the example I used. If I lost you there, don't worry about it too much. The, the important stuff was the validating and mutating webhooks, but it's fine. Any questions, ask down below and I will help. Now, moving forward, I'm gonna stop. 
this is it now until after Christmas. I'm not stopping for good, just until after Christmas. So I'm going to spend a few weeks sorting out all the historical thumbnails. You may have noticed I've been updating some of them recently and just adding better ones, in my opinion, I guess. And with that in mind, I want to get rid of all the old ones that just use screenshots of the title sequence and replace them with something a bit better to make them a little bit more appealing, which is going to take me a few weeks because I'm a one-man band and I'm not an artist. Simple as. So once I've done that, I'm going to be looking at things that we do on the cluster as a new series, if you like. So looking at Argo, looking at probably Flux, just GitOps in general, looking at CICD, looking at monitoring with Prometheus and Alert Manager and showing nice pretty graphs with Grafana and OPA and all this good stuff. So all the stuff you would do on the cluster afterwards. What you got to remember is what we've done in the previous set of videos is stuff that you need to know about Kubernetes, but stuff that you won't be doing day to day. You will write all your stuff out and automate it. You need to be able to automate yourself almost out of a job, but not quite. The idea being that once you've set all the basics up, you can then iterate and improve, make things better, make things faster, make things cleaner, make things more secure. This is kind of where we're going next. We're going to be looking at what we do on day two, I guess. That's probably the best way I can word it. So with that in mind, I'll see you in the next one.